I was making a fuck ton of money. I was making a lot of money, all cash. About two years in, I started doing coke because everybody else was doing coke. Right. Um, unlucky for me, I was right. <laughs> and once I started, it was a fucking problem, you know? Right. So I always had, uh, growing up, I had a good family. Like, uh, my, my, my mom and dad loved me a lot. I had large Italian family, right? So, uh, lots of yelling, lots of loud noises, lots of food. Um, but everybody cared for each other, you know? Um, great group of cousins. Um, and so, you know, my, my, I always had a feeling of less than, of not enough, of I don't fit in, I'm not good enough, um, whether it was sports or school or just life. Um, my first, probably the first thing that I picked up to try and change the way I feel was food. Um, overeating, binge eating, um, covering emotions with food. Very easy to do in my household because if you're happy, you eat. And if you were said you eat, and when you had a good day, you ate. Right. And so, um, and you the, know, and the food's all Italian, so it's top. Correct. Much. It's it's very. It was very good food. And yeah, you went to my grandmother's house, and she wanted to feed you. And you know, when you first walked in the door at my house, my mom, this is what we're having for dinner, and it's enough for eighty nine people. You know, right. so there's like, so um, yeah, that was the first thing I really used to try to change the way I feel. Um, yeah. You know, and as I got as I got older into my teens, you know, 13, 14, 15, started experimenting with cigarettes at first and then weed and, um, you know, went from from smoking a lot of weed to selling a lot of weed to um, using the money from selling the weed to buy ecstasy and mushrooms and acid and whatever and quaaludes of supposedly quaaludes, right? <laughs> not probably not real. Uh, just getting my hands on whatever I could get my hands on. Um, and so I think, you know, I had a lot, when I was 16, I had a lot kind of happen. So I had, I had a really good friend, um, a really, a really good friend. So he and I would sell weed together. We do all types of drugs together. I go to his house every day <clears throat> and, uh, this one day he hit me up after school and he was like, Hey man you want to come over and spot me while I lift? Uh, he had a bench in his basement and I was like, man, I got to go. I got to go pick up. I had to go meet somebody to pick up a bunch of shit. Can't be there. Um, and, uh, so didn't show up for him, showed up to get the drugs on the way back from getting the drugs. My other friend called me and said, Hey man, this dude dropped a barbell on his neck benching and died. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was some dispute with the reports, whether it was suicide or accidental. Um, I definitely believe that it was accidental. Um, he was one of those dudes who would just get so angry and lift and lift and lift and lift. Um, and just didn't know when to stop, you know? <laughs> um, so that, that hit me pretty hard for a long time. You know, I felt like I should have been there. I should have been there to help him. Um, you know, 16 years old, the first thing I did that day was I went to his house. He had a little brother. I grabbed his little brother and me and my other friend took him. We went to a pizza place because we didn't know what else to do, and we're just kind of sitting there. Um, but I ended up, you know, having to help his mom clean the blood off of the carpet and, like, help. I uh, was a pallbearer in his funeral, help arrange all that. And, like, um, so that was, a, that was a tough time. I went through a pretty dark period there. Um, prior to that, you know, like, I, my, my self-esteem was, was pretty low. When I was 14... Uh, I was pretty suicidal, um, attempted, uh, attempted suicide. I took, took my dad's gun, put it in my mouth, loaded it, pulled the trigger and it just didn't go off. And so like loaded, uh, loaded. Oh, wow. Reason I'm not dead is because the gun didn't work, you know? And so like my, 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 uh, my mental health issues were like always, uh, pretty rough at, at that, at that age. And so like 16, I have this friend who dies and, and, um, and I'm struggling a lot. And my brother and his friends, um, open a nightclub. And so my brother comes to me and he's, uh, I have been working at a pizza place 
which I was using the pizza place as a front to sell weed out of the back, you know, but like I was working at this pizza place and knew how to make pizza. And he was trying, my brother was trying to take care of me. And he was like, Hey, I got this nightclub. Why don't you come run the kitchen of this nightclub? Um, you can be there. You can sell whatever you want. You pay us rent. You keep all the money. And so like, um, at 16 years old, that's, that's what I did. I was at 16. Well, wow. I was, uh, slang and fucking chicken fingers and french fries out of a out of a window in a nightclub um making like good money like making more money than i'd ever seen before um and uh my my brother you know he was having trouble with with staff and within a couple months i was like a manager of this place at 16 years old i was running the bar backs and 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 a manager of of uh I guess I say a middle manager of one of the nightclubs, you know? So once I started doing that, I was making a fuck ton of money. I was making a lot of money, all cash, um, for a young kid, you know? Uh, um, and so being around that scene, um, there was a lot of drugs and lots of people would offer me Coke and this and that, but I, I never really fucked with it because I knew that if I fucked with it, it was not going to end well. Right. You know what I mean? It was not going to go well for me. And, uh, like a year, a year or two into the nightclub scene. So my brother is opening clubs in different locations. Um, Boston, a uh, bunch on Long Island. He had one in Chicago. Um, got part of the Coyote Ugly franchise. So building those out, Philadelphia. Really? And so like he was doing well. I was doing well. I was helping him run these establishments. All the girls that you could ever dream of, right? Um all the drugs, all the money. And uh, about two years in, I started doing Coke because everybody else was doing Coke. Right. Um, and uh, unlucky for me, I was right. <laughs> and once I started, it was a fucking problem, you know? Right. And so um, I I quickly developed a pretty intense cocaine habit. Um, and that lasted till I was about 24 years old. Uh, my family intervened on me. Um my brother pushed me out all the nightclub stuff because I was going to die. Um, so he was trying to save my life, you know? Um, and, uh, and so at, at 24 years old, I'm out of the nightclub scene. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life during that time, like leading up to 23, 24. Um, I kept looking for things to, 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 uh, to make, to have me not do Coke. Right. So like, I'm, I'm going to get a hobby. I'm going to do this. I'm going to find a girl. I had started working at this hospital because my thought was like, um, they had this radiology school at the hospital. And I was like, man, if I can start working at the hospital, you have a better chance of getting into this radiology school. So I was working in the kitchen of this hospital, mm -hmm. um, as a supervisor, um, making, making like, you know, bullshit money. But my goal was to be in radiology. And I met this girl, um, hung out with her two or three times. And, uh, one of those nights that I hung out with her, um, I come out of a blackout and we had just finished having sex and I don't have a condom on. And so, um, 24 years old, I'm out of the nightclub scene. I find out that I have a child on the way mm -hmm. with some girl that I hung out with three times, you know, right. and, uh, my life is headed not in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And now I have a child on the way. And again, um, big Italian family. And so, uh. There was no question whether I was going to be a father or not, whether I was going to take care of that child or not. That's what was going to happen. Right. And so, uh, religious Catholic, very Catholic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. no other option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There wasn't. A... And so, um, a friend of mine, a friend of mine had gotten sober through AA and he was seeing this therapist. Um, and so I went to see this therapist, his name is Nick Cardaris and good guy. I'm still close with him today. Um, and Nick had been in the nightclub scene and had burnt his entire life down and was now a therapist. And so I started seeing him. He told me to start going to AA and NA. Um, and I put some time together, you know, put, put some time together. Um, and I was sitting in Nick's office and I was like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, you know? And he was like, well, why don't you do what I do? And I was like, I don't really like care to do that. You know, I don't really care to be a therapist. And he was like, well, do you want to help people? And I was like, yeah, I think I need something with a purpose. And he was like, all right, well, you 
become a therapist and then get into the treatment industry. Um, and I have been to outpatients before I had been to, I went to one treatment center and my insurance cut me off and they kicked me out after nine days. You know, like I'd done that. I was on a wait list at one time for a long-term treatment center and they make me call every day and I would call. And after 90 days, they'd be like, nah, we're good. You know, like I had been working with a sponsor and stuff. So I knew that I didn't love the treatment industry. I mm -hmm. knew that it definitely needed uh, some help by my estimation. And so Nick helped me get into college and I went back and got a bachelor's in social work and a master's in social work and then kind of got some jobs and started working in, uh, started working in the treatment center industry. Um, and I got hired by, um, this one treatment center, a place in East Hampton that was, uh, it was kind of designed for the rich and famous. Right. And so like first I did a contracting firm, I designed their family program, um, and I had a private practice on the side. I was seeing young kids who struggle with addiction. I was kind of always where my, my heart lied. Mm -hmm. 15 to 17 year old kid, knuckleheads. Yeah. Um, I started doing this family program for them. And then they hired me on as a full-time therapist. And the day they hired me, the clinical director and the executive director both quit. The clinical director got a job offer in, in New York City. The executive director got a job offer in Florida. And so they both give their notice. And so... I walked into the owner's office and I was like, Hey man, um, you need somebody to run this place. And he was like, you're right. I do. And I was like, you're looking at him. And, uh, he was like, I don't really know if you have the experience to do this kind of thing. And I was like, so you're right. And you don't have another option. Like no one else here could run this place. No one else here has management experience. We had a state audit coming up in 30 days and he's like, all right, I'm going to give you a shot. If in 30 days we do okay on the state audit, you run the place. And so for 30 days, I worked, you know, 16, 18 hours a day, slept at the place, like made sure everything was perfect. Right. Got our state audit, got the highest score in the state. And that was it. I was off and running. Dude, um, you've, you've had all the luck with the jobs. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I busted my busted my ass to, to do that. But yeah, the, I mean, not, yes. not, I don't know. No, 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 no. You didn't the opportunities it, yeah. were there though. Right. Like, like my, um, what happened was I was, I, I believed I was in the right place at the right mm -hmm. time for a lot. Like my brother giving me the opportunities and then I was good even when I was fucked up at seeing like, oh, if there's an opportunity, I need to capitalize yeah. on this, right? And so that kind of stuck with me into sobriety. Like if there was an opportunity, why would I want to be a counselor when I could run the whole damn deal? Mm -hmm. you know? and so right. like, if there was an opportunity, I was going to jump all over it and... In early sobriety, I was cocky enough and sure. I mean, like, I completely narcissistic. Right. You know, like I could run the whole country if you wanted. Right, to. right. And so, um, yeah, there was no doubt in my mind that I could do it and do it better. Um, and I was with that company for three or four years, and then uh, ended up in Texas. And I've been in Texas running treatment center since. Wow, it's kind of long and short of it. Yeah. Right. And, oh yeah. And obviously, my son was born. I have custody of my son. He's <laughs> he's lived with me. Um, Pretty much since since his birth, so yeah, that's been an amazing journey as well. Right. Learning how to be a, a father, so yeah, okay. yeah. So throughout your whole journey, what what do you remember having like that rock bottom moment where you just kind of look around and you're like, "Fuck!" Like, yeah, I, I need to change this shit. So for me, like it it wasn't um, it wasn't one moment it like, as I remembered, it was a period in time, right? Like it was, it was a period in time where like, I couldn't look myself in the mirror, right? Like any mirror that was in my apartment was down or turned around, hated myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't want to be around anybody, but I was so fucking lonely that I like, uh, it, uh, it hurt so bad. Right. Yeah. And like, I remember that period in time just being so miserable. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I lived in uh, a town on the North Fork of Long Island called Mattituck. Gorgeous, right? And like, I would get cocaine and drive down to the beach and just sit at the beach doing cocaine, thinking about killing myself. So right. like, in one of the most beautiful settings yep. and couldn't see the beauty in anything, you know? And so that period of time uh, kind of stands out for me as my bottom and there was lots of stuff along the way you know hurting family hurting friends hurting loved ones doing all the bullshit uh my uncle was on uh uh had some cancer treatment i was stealing his fucking pain pills you know like remember uh taking a bunch of pain pills doing coke throwing up because the pain pills made me dope sick 
and picking the pain pills out of the throw up to, to make sure I didn't waste them, you know, like lots of moments like that. But when I really think about my rock bottom, it was a deep, dark, like loathing of the person that I was. Right. That's what stands out for me the most. Right. Yeah. Dude, I am. So there was a, a couple years there where I was living in Miami and in Pompano Beach and mm-hmm. living in pretty much paradise. You know, yep. I come from Northeast Ohio, so Miami yep. and all that's paradise to me. And I think I remember that time in those years, I might have been on the beach once or twice. And it was because I was killing time waiting for the dope man yeah, yeah. To, to, get, to get what he needed. And the whole rest of the time, I'm held up in a bedroom, yep. sitting there just getting high and, like, not ever existing outside of that world. Yep. And, like, you know, I like the way you said it because, you know, there's that one rock bottom moment. Like, mm-hmm. mine was in prison, but there's so many other times yeah. in my experience where it's just like, yeah, holy shit. Like, yeah. And I was too dumb to realize how bad it really was. Yeah. Because you're just that mental obsession. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky when I got sober. Um, so, you know, like I, I went, I talked about the therapist that I went to and like he helped me with therapy, but what got me sober was AA, right? right. Um, and so I was lucky when I got sober that I was around a group of guys who like, um, they cared enough to, to like want to help me and also like didn't feed my ego at all. Like my first sponsor was this guy, Jim. He was like six six, like three three hundred fifty pound carpenter, right? And uh, I remember one day I was bitching. He was like, "Hey man, fucking drink, don't drink. I don't give a fuck. If you want to feel better, like this is what you need to do." Right. And and really, like, didn't feed into this. Like, oh poor me, I don't know what you know what I mean. And I had a group of guys around me who were like that. Who were like, "Hey, if you want to live a really good life, we'll show you how to do it. If you want to just sit there and bitch and complain, go someplace else. Right. Put in the work or don't. Yeah. Um. And so, yeah, I was, I was really blessed to have those, those group of guys around me. Yes. Yeah. It's funny how, and you know, it's, it's the same thing with, I was just having a conversation earlier today with a young gentleman and, you know, he was, he was upset with how somebody in authority handled their, you know, authority sure. handled, handled a situation with him. And I was telling him, it's like, dude, like everybody reacts to different things. Yeah. Like I've, I've coached clients for a long time. You know, I, I pride myself on being able to like, what gets this one to react? I need to shit talk him a little bit, get him yeah. going, and then he yeah. starts producing. Sure. Or it's this other one where you have to take a softer approach, sure. a little bit more nurturing. Yeah. So it's cool that you, you know, you fall in with who you're supposed to fall yeah, in. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And you fell in with those guys absolutely. that were not going to put up yeah, with bullshit. No, they yeah, they were. I had a I had a therapist in the VA, and he was the one that was known. You don't want to get him yeah. because he was straight shooter, doesn't put up with any bullshit. Sure. And he could he'll call you on your shit and all that. And of course, I get him. He ends up being a very close fr- friend to this day, one of yeah. the most influential people in my recovery mm-hmm. because he saw through my bullshit and yeah. called me on it time and time again. Every time. To yeah. where then I would just go into his office and lay it all out honestly and openly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't want to get called on my <laughs> yeah. bullshit anymore. Yeah. So that was your rock bottom moment. Mm-hmm. Do you have a moment in, in your journey where it was like your moment of redemption where you would just kind of looked around and you're like, man, I've, I'm fucking back. I'm here. I made it. Not necessarily. Yeah. I, I know how we in recovery look at it. You can't ever say I got this or anything like that. But that moment where you're just your heart was full and you're like, man, I'm I fucking made it through this. Yeah. I mean, I remember. <laughs> so, like, uh, I think one of the days that gave me the most hope. So, like, um, when I got out of school, when I finished my master's degree, you know, I had a kid and like. I got, at first I got this like bullshit job, like I was telling you and like bullshit in the means of like, they were paying me not even enough to like meet poverty, right? Like I think they were paying me like $22,000 a year, right? Mm-hmm. I'm living in one of the most expensive markets in, in the world. I have the son and my family's helping me. And so I love the job, but I was like, I can't live on this. You know, <laughs> the day that I got hired by that treatment center in East Hampton, starting salary was 50 grand, right? And I remember like tears rolling down my face because I was like, holy shit, like I can like I can get my kid what he wants. Like I can I could pay rent and buy food. Right. And really seeing the hope of like, oh, this is gonna work. You know, like this this isn't this isn't something where I have to be like miserable and struggle. Like this is just the beginning and already like God and hard work is providing what what I need, you know? Mm. I think up until that point I was I was really hanging on by a thread. Like I'm going to work as hard as I can. And I have no idea if this shit's going to fly, you know? Um, 
And then, you know, there were a lot of moments after that. You know, the day I got married was one of them, you know, like somebody actually wanted to marry me. Um, yeah, I, recently with my son, like seeing the person that he's he's grown in, into be. Um, I remember a couple of years ago he was playing football and uh, there was a kickoff and he caught this ball and ran it all the way back for a touchdown, you know, like. And after the game, he hops in my truck and he was like, um, did you see that? And I was like, of course I saw it. And he was like, aren't you proud of me? And I was like, I'm so proud of you and you should be proud of yourself. But like that moment hit me and stays with me because I was like, um, I'm able to show up for him today, right? Like I'm able to be a good dad. And also made me realize like, oh shit, I got like a lot of influence. If this is this young man's like first thought is like, are you proud of me, right? Um, and so trying to make sure that, uh, you know, I have a deal with my son. He doesn't know I have a deal with him. Uh, but I make sure that I tell him I love you at least twice a day, every day. And I've done that since, since he was, since he was born, you know, and I, I, I continue to do that. It's getting to the age where it's a little embarrassing for him, but I, but I keep doing it, you know? Um, and so just trying to, trying to, uh, really, um, be a good person. All right. So yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's, <laughs> that, that hits me because I remember being that kid and, uh, you know, one, I just recently went up to see my father and my brother was getting married and, and, and being around my dad. And, you know, he wasn't, he left when I was two, you know, mm -hmm. I'd see him sporadically sure. here and there, but you know, there was so much of my identity as a, as a young man, you know, grade school, high school tied up and being in this basketball player. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I was. That was my identity. And it always it always bugged me that he never never one time that he come down from New York and, and see me play sure. a game. Granted, he's got his own stuff going on. He's working, sure. you know, doesn't have time. But as a kid, like, yeah, I just want dad to see me sure do this up. thing I love. Yeah. And it took me to get an adulthood, and it was like, I right, I never. My dad never seen me play basketball, but my stepdad watched me hit a grand slam to win a game for us to go to the playoff. Yeah, yeah. And like, I remember hitting that grand slam. And I even like scuffed up the ball where I had hit it. Like, sure. I mean, I like almost knocked the cover off. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> and I just remember my stepdad was working turns, um, and he had made it. He made it to the game. He had just come off midnight turn, no sleep, sure. but like he was there and saw it. And I remember us going to Dairy Queen, and it's like, all right, like I just needed to change my perspective. Yeah. Because the one that raised me got to see there. that. Yeah, yeah. The one that was supposed to see that. Sure. But you know. I guess that's a, a therapy moment yeah, that I need to work through. I guess so. <laughs> but speak, speaking of therapy and, yeah. and, and you being a therapist, yeah. like, I'm I'm curious on your thoughts as far as, like, you know, with the recovery industry. I, I feel like it's these past couple of years, you know, the game's kind of changed and it shifted a little bit. I don't know sure. if it's for the better or for the worse, but what, I, what I've enjoyed is it doesn't seem to be this, like, cookie cutter, like, this is the only way. Yeah, and so I, you've said it, and I'd, I've said it earlier today, where it's like I understand the twelve steps, and the, sure. the program is my foundation. Sure, and you can't really tell people in treatment. It's like, hey, eventually, hopefully, mm -hmm. you're gonna find what works for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you know what the work you all do out here with the meditation, and mm -hmm. you know I found fitness, but it's like you find these things, and you're able to build on it to yeah. where you find your perfect equation of what your recovery looks like. Yeah, yeah I think the recovery industry is evolving a lot and it still needs to do a lot more evolving um i think the, the hard part for the recovery industry is um you know it's rife with fraud fraud, yeah. fraud is is a huge part of the recovery industry unfortunately um you know you've heard me say before that like the recovery industry is run mostly by drug addicts and yeah. drug addicts tend to lie you yeah. know and so you get these guys who and and females for that matter who run these companies and um, relapse or we put money first and, and it doesn't go well. Um, but as far as like options and access to care, um, I am all for options and access to care, right? So <clears throat> I believe in a, in a free marketplace and the more competition there is, the better, um, the better they get, the better the, the, the companies get. And so, um, I was talking to a friend recently about a state like Oklahoma, and he said, you know, I don't think we have any real sophisticated treatment here. And I said, oh, that's probably because you don't have any competition. You got four or five places in the whole state. And the more competition there is, then it forces everybody to, to be better. Evolve, yeah. right? It forces them to have a better clinical program, um, a better uh, peer recovery program, et cetera, aftercare program. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think there, 
there are a million different ways that people can stop using substances, right? Mm -hmm. For me, for me, it was the 12 steps, right? Like that's, that's what got me, got me sober and, and, uh, keeps me sober. Um, you know, where, where I struggle, where I struggle with the recovery industry is as new stuff comes up. So, um, you know, there'll be a new clinical study and I'll, and I'll read it. And I'll be like, Oh, that's really, really cool. What happens though, is it, it turns into this war where instead of there being a place established in the market for this new deal, the two factions go to war. Right. And so like, um, the, the, the clinical protocol will be touted as the new thing. And you have to use this cause it's the medical model and it has to, it's evidence-based, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> instead of it being like, Hey, here's a really great option. It's right. a really great option for people and it may work. Right. So at burning tree, one of the things that I think we do best, um, is work with families and, um, whether a person's working in admissions or business development or the counselors, we want to be really clear that like our program isn't for everybody. Um, you know, we have two of them <laughs> and both of them are for specific people. And so when people call and they don't fit that, that, um, that patient profile, what we do is help them get someplace else. Cause we're not just going to take somebody if we're not the right fit for them. Right. Um, <clears throat> and lots of times I see people trying to take everybody and lots of times I see different things being touted as the, as the new thing. Right. And so for a lot of years it was, uh, it was suboxone and now it's trauma treatment and now ketamine and all these other things that are going to cure addiction. Truth is different people probably benefit from different things. If you took me and gave me ketamine, I would just do ketamine now. I mean, right. if, you know, if you took me right. and gave me suboxone, I would just do a lot of suboxone then, you know? And so like that wouldn't have worked for me. Right. doesn't mean it doesn't work for some people. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, you know, I've been privileged to to be able to come out here and speak and and do all that. And I and I used to come out for your family programming. And, sure. and I've adopted a lot of I borrowed a lot of I wouldn't say a lot, but I borrowed sure. tidbits of what sure. you say and have sure. implemented it into mine because yeah. you know, as working in this industry for a while and being so close to it, I you know I thought I'd heard it all. But yeah. when you go up there and and you start talking about the the curve of of mm -hmm. you know people's people's journey and treatment, mm -hmm. you know. And what it needs to look like, you know what I mean? The masses of people do not know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time you you said, you know, what's somebody's success rate and for who goes 30 days, yeah. 30 days inpatient treatment and just goes home with no aftercare. Yeah. And you said 0 .02. 0 .02. My jaw dropped. Yeah. And, th and that's one thing that I talk about. And like, you know, trying to get people's, you know, I've been doing uh, interventions recently and trying to get families to understand and wrap their head around like, hey. 18 months. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's what you're in for now. Like yeah. this is the first step right here. We're getting yep. them in detox or treatment or whatever like yep. that. But 18 months, it's, I mean, it's staggering. Why as prevalent as this <coughs> issue is in this country yeah. and the world and stuff like that, why do you feel most people don't know this? Um, couple reasons. Uh, one is I think that treatment is expensive. Um, and, families want a certain level of um success based on price right and they're yeah. like hey <clears throat> there are treatment centers out there that charge sixty five thousand dollars a month right in my opinion absurd but there are places that do it right and so for sixty five thousand dollars you better fucking fix the problem you know right. give me sixty five thousand dollars to fix my house you better fix the house right? right and so i think there's expectations that that families have and they're um the stigma around addiction, they want to fix and they want to fix now. Um, and the, the second part of that is I think treatment centers, um, you know, some of them purposely lie about their outcomes and other ones, um, feel like they have to advertise these outcomes, um, so that people will be willing to pay the price. Right. And so they'll do things like say, you know, 95% of our clients stay sober. And what they don't tell you is that what they mean is that after seven days, they've called a hundred clients, 10 have answered the phone. And out of those 10, nine and a half or nine have said, I'm still sober. And so like, that's not an outcome study. Right. That's not a real outcome study. Um, and so, you know, they tout these st statistics to try and unfortunately fool people. And again, it's interesting because addiction, um, 
Addiction is one of the only industries that treats chronic health problems where people is, expect an immediate fix. And so, you know, if you had cancer, a doctor is going to tell you your treatment course and he's not going to say like, hey, I'm going to cure you in one day or I'm going right. to cure you in 20 days. He's going to tell you this is what it's going to look like. I made you surgery. I made you chemo. I made you et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a long process. We're going to have to check back up on you. We're going to have to do follow-ups. You're going to have to change this. <clears throat> and I... I I believe there's no ego involved in that. The doctor knows this is what's going to work, and so he tells you. Mm -hmm. um, in the treatment center industry, lots of times there's lots of ego. We're going to fix your loved one no matter what. Right. I mean, that's just not true. Right. It's not true. So, yeah. Right. That's one of the, since the day I met you, you've always, you shoot it, you shoot it straight. Sure. Like, you're saying a lot of things right now I don't think a lot of people would say. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, so, man, you, you've been nice enough to share about your journey through addiction mm -hmm. and how you got here. Looking back, what would you say is the most valuable lesson that you've learned? Um, so there's a, there's a couple of them in different areas, right? Like in business, the best lesson that I learned was to fail and fail quickly. Like fail often, fail quickly, right? Mm -hmm. It's a saying a lot of people have heard. Um, and that helped me like um, try new things, listen to the people around me. And really quickly pivot when it wasn't working. Right. We're going to try this in the program. You know, a couple months in, it's not working. Change it. Right. Very, very simple. Don't stick with it till your, to your death. Right. Um, in the recovery world, um, you know, on my on my journey in in sobriety, um, I think a couple of my biggest takeaways are, um, you know, I believe that I've recovered. Right? I believe that I've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and yep. body, right? And so um, I also don't believe that I am immune. And so, again, you know, I work in this industry, I live this industry, and I also um, know that I need to put in the work to stay healthy, just like I need to go to the gym if I want to continue to build muscle. Recently, I took a couple months off from the gym, been kind of like, eh, and, like, all of a sudden I'm sitting here shocked when my muscle mass has dropped and my fat has gone up, right? right. And so, like... That would not be a shock to you, <laughs> but right. And so I know that I need to continue to put in the work, um, as a father and a husband, uh, you know, my biggest takeaways have been to, uh, been to communicate and to be open and honest. I think that's, uh, that's one thing that, uh, you know, my, in my marriage, uh, it, it, it seems simple, but it definitely wasn't, wasn't simple for me. You know, like I, I remember, um, so when I was like, <clears throat> when I was like seven or eight years old, my dad, my dad said something to me. I was, I was trying to, he was asking me for, um, for an adjustable wrench. I didn't know what it was and no. And it was one of those moments with your dad where like, hold the flashlight moment, right? I'm panicking, <laughs> panicking. Cause I don't know what this deal is. And so finally I, I like bring over four things. Like, I don't know, a hammer, a screwdriver, <laughs> you know, I'm like, here you go. And he looks at me and he goes, Hey man, you better get a job that doesn't involve working with your hands because you can't do this. Now, my dad was a mechanic. My brother was a mechanic. Like they all work with uncles in construction. They'll work with their hands. Right. That fucked me up, dude. Right. So like I am, um, I'm, I'm married now. Right. And, um, I, I do something around the house, whatever it is. Right. I fix window trim and my wife comes in and she goes, mm, I don't know if that's right. What I heard was, you're not good enough. Right. You're not going to live up to your dad's expectations, right? You're not a man. You don't know how to take care of things. And I fucking fly off the handle, and I rip the trim off the window, and I throw the hammer, right? And, like, it took me a long time to be able to, to, be able to communicate with her in a way that was like, hey, what did you mean by that? And what she really meant is, like, um, we need to put some wood filler in that crack so that we can paint it, right? Mm-hmm much different than like, you're not a man. You right. know? And so like right. what I hear and what she says are different. So it took a long time to, to, to get that one semi right. Cause I still don't have a perfect. Yeah. And I, I have the privilege of knowing your wife and, <laughs> yeah. I, and I do know, I must have the same problem because she said things to me that sure. I'm still thinking about <laughs> yeah. three weeks later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the community, you know, I've, you know, I've been recently married and, yeah. and communication is, is, has been the biggest thing. Anytime we have a little thing, it always boils down to yep. one of us was not communicating the yep. right way or, or whatever like that. For sure. So that's great. What, um, 
somebody that's watching this out there right now and they, they've heard your story and, and something you said has hit them in a certain way where it really resonates with them what is your what is your advice to them if they're out there still going through it um i mean my advice to anybody who's suffering with addiction is to get help right and and to get help from um somebody you can trust um yeah i you know a uh, a couple of weeks ago, I lost a very, very close friend of mine to a fentanyl overdose. Been losing friends to this disease since 16 years old. Um, and the, the truth is that, like, um, the game that, that we're playing today is a different game mm -hmm. than when you and I were coming up. You know, yeah. like, fentanyl wasn't a thing when we right. were coming up, you know? Um, and so the game today has changed. And, like, people, a guy said to me uh, yesterday, I was talking to him about it, and he said, when kids are using drugs today, they're playing Russian roulette with three bullets in the chamber. You know, it's, it's, it's changed. And so I would say get help and get help fast. Um, don't let yourself uh, die because that's what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. To, I mean, not a, a place that I speak or a person that I don't talk to. I'm not thankful. I, I hear some of these stories and see these people dropping left to right. I mean, yeah. you, you can't turn on the news without seeing some of the, one of these kids ODing that are in high yeah. school grade school even and stuff yeah. like that so th thank god and i or you got out when we did because yeah. i wouldn't be dead <laughs> for oh for sure for sure there's there's no way i would not be uh, yeah. and yeah, fentanyl is the number one killer 18 uh, to 50 year olds right now yeah and number, just, number I, just one killer. I just saw that yesterday yeah it's, yeah it's above cancer now right yep that's yep. that's so wild and it's equal to a southwest plane going down every day that's how many people are dying every single day it's equal to a southwest plane crashing and everybody on board dying and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild and it's not going to get better. I mean, it's yeah. not, it's, it's, it's a, it's a running joke in our house. Um, with as many commercials as you see for medicines mm -hmm. and then, you know, they're telling you the side effects, but it's somebody up in a hot air balloon or sure. walking hand in hand in the park. Yeah. And so we were, we were talking a couple of nights ago and I was like, do you know how many people there are probably out there that like, you know, whether they're older or whatever, they're sitting there and, and they're just like writing the names down mm -hmm. and it's like, ask your doctor about this and they go, can I get on this? Can I get on this? Can I get on this? Yeah. yeah. Um, dude, it's, it's scary. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, <clears throat> the opioid epidemic has made me much more skeptical. Not that I wasn't before, but of, um, of big pharma in general. So, you know, like, you know me, like I struggle with my weight a lot. Right. And so like, um, 40 in a couple days, Increase my physical activity a bunch, watching what I eat, still gaining weight. And my doctor was like, you know, we want to put you on one of these weight loss medications. Sounds great until I start looking at how this deal works and like the side effects of it. And I'm like, man, like I should probably have a radical diet change before I do this. Right. Um, just because I don't know what it's going to do long term. Um, you know, Suboxone to me, like when it first came out, that's what made me the most skeptical. I was like, so the people who are killing all my friends and got us all hooked on dope are now giving us the antidote to the dope, right. which is a different dope to keep us hooked on. Right. You know, kind of really changed the way that I, that I look at things. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting time to be alive. Did I remember going into the doctor and telling them that it, it was time I wanted to get off Suboxone. Yeah. And up until that point, all they ever did every time that, how are things going? Everything's good. All right, we want to up you, and yeah. they were trying to put me on 16 milligrams a day. Luckily, I had never went up that high. Sure. And so, but I went in there and and flat out told them I was like, you know, I want to get off this. They're like, oh, you can't. Yeah. I'm like, what do you mean I can't? They're like, well, you're you're gonna go back to heroin. You're gonna relapse for sure. And I was like, no, like, I'm living a healthy lifestyle. I'm in recovery. I'm around good people. I'm I'm, I'm doing groups. I'm doing this. And I'm like, no. And they would like forcing me to like want to stay on it and yeah. i mean getting off suboxone was way harder for me getting off uh yeah. getting off heroin i'm sure that and, and i'm sure their chief concern was to keep you alive right um let's hope let's hope yeah that's that's hope hopefully their chief concern was to keep you alive um sometimes it's not right and uh and yeah the, a lot of times a more complete patient assessment would need to be done for them to say whether you should come off or not right um I, again, with with Suboxone, like when I was when I was like 22, I had a friend who was doing heroin who switched to Suboxone. When I was telling him I was going to go to rehab and do all this stuff, he was like, "Man, just go on Suboxone," and I was like, "Man, that sounds too easy. Like that doesn't for some reason it didn't sit right with yeah. me." I think like a year later he was dead because he shot as much as he could to shoot over the Suboxone and just kept shooting, just kept shooting, just kept shooting, died. Um, 
and that 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 cemented that for me i was like oh there's there's not there is not an easy fix to this there is no wonder pill out there that's gonna fix what i have right i'm gonna have to put in the work right i remember when i was living in miami i'm shooting heroin and my neighbor who i would also shoot heroin with would give me suboxone for free sure but i never i never had patience whatsoever yeah so I would always take it too early before I was actually sick and put myself in an immediate withdrawal. <laughs> it happened ten, 10 times. I never learned my lesson. And so I remember uh, finally it was the first time I was going to go to treatment. It was the only time my family was going to get help. They were shipping me off to a detox in, uh, in Tampa. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, finally, I'm going to go somewhere. I'm going to get some good shit now to come down off that. And I show up and it's fucking Sabah. And I was like, God damn it. I can't get away from it. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So I got a fun question for you. Sure. Right. To kind of change gears right now. Hypothetically speaking, uh-huh. tonight you're walking out for the heavyweight championship of the world. UFC. You're about to fight. Yeah. What is your fight song you're walking out to? Oh, man. Uh it would probably be that song. I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. You know, like, you'd have to have something like that. But I think that if I was gonna do that, <clears throat> first of all, I would never do that. Let's just stop. I get my shit pushed back real quick. <laughs> um, uh, I, I tell a lot of people like I like to fight when I when I was I and I would get my ass kicked every time. Like I was a fighter and could not. I like I'd get I'd just get destroyed. Right. Um, I was always going to stand up for my friends, but I was going to lose every, every time, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I thought, of, you know, the other day I was watching UFC and I was like, man, I don't understand. I guess Tai Tuivasa came out to the Barbie song, but I would think somebody would be doing that right now with the movie going crazy. Like, I would think I would look for some type of cross promotion that I could get paid on. Yeah. Something like that. Oh, you're thinking about it deep right there. Yeah, I would want something that's, like, going to blow up so that then I can get some right. residuals from that. What song, like, what kind of music you listen to? What gets your blood pumping? If you're listening to it in the gym, what do you want to hear? So I listen to every type of music except for death metal uh, and um, different music for different times. When I'm in the gym, it's mostly, I guess you'd call it old school hip hop now because I'm old. But it was just hip hop when I was listening to it. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of of Nas, a lot of Jay-Z, Big Pun, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Yeah. That's my shit, too. So. Yeah. Glad to hear you say it. All right. So I want to do a little little back and forth right now. Sure. I'm going to ask you some. Uh, I'm going to throw out some terms. I just want you to give me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. All right. Sobriety. Joy. Joy. Mm-hmm. Good. Fitness. Struggle. <laughs> That's good. Favorite movie. Lord of the Rings. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that's right. You got all the books and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. All right. Therapy. Helpful. Road bike. And body. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I would probably say love. <laughs> love. Yeah. yeah. Have you been riding? Yeah. 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 Are you getting ready for a race? No, I really am just trying to get healthier. I keep getting encouraged to do a race, but uh, when I when I ride the bike and I'm just listening to books and riding, it's like the one time and I'm just like. Just focusing on myself, just having a good time. Right. Yeah. It's kind of doing it. it Meditative almost. That's what I was just going to yeah. say. That's what running was for yeah. me for a long time. That was my meditation. Yeah. There's this, uh, there's this state park by my house that I ride up in. It's got a ton of hills and all these pine trees. And like when I hit that state park and I smell those trees, like my whole mood changes. No, right. I can just be back there for hours just, just riding. Yeah. It's real hot now, but yeah, I'm, I'll go back there for two, three hours and ride and, and, uh, until my feet start to burn in the, in the shoes. But yeah. Right. mindset back there what's yeah. what's the longest you've ever rode 30 miles i'm gonna yeah 30, 30 miles ain't no punk in uh texas heat but not in the in the cycling world it kind of is I, right. you gotta try, i guess i gotta push it to 50 but then you get here's my problem with that then you get into golf world where you're out of the house for four or five hours right like that's a long time right i got a wife who's very demanding you know so she doesn't want me to play golf because it takes too long so <laughs> she had mentioned that to me recently yeah, yeah. that so that's what the, you know, when people ask me why, why you know, there's a lot of reasons I segued from running in, into the gym and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And one of the biggest reasons was, you know, I, I got into running races. I started doing well at races, won a marathon, started placing in ultras and all that. 
and it put on added pressure. But what I didn't love was I didn't really love the process. Sure. Like when I'm running 80, 90 miles a week and it takes up a huge chunk of your time. Yeah. And I love being good at running. I love doing good at races, but I didn't love the process. And I yeah. think that's that's one of the reasons I segued into the gym is because I fell in love with the process yeah. at the gym. Like, I don't want to do a bodybuilding show. Yeah. I'm never stepping on stage, but I love the process of doing it every day. Yep. And so I don't have that added pressure that I need to do well or anything like mm-hmm. that. It's my it's my therapy. Yeah. So that's great. Golf. The uh, waste of time. I mess with any, any, a lot of our friends are golfers. And yeah. I fuck with them unmercifully. I'm like, why don't you play a real sport? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do something. Yeah, they love it. They do. They they love it. Yeah. I just, I don't get it. Yeah. But I don't have the patience. Now, mini golf. I fuck with mini golf. All right. I don't know if you know this, but Charlie and I were the champions of South Audra. They had a, they had a tournament on the whole island. He and I won. Really? Our team won the Rockets. We were the champions. Yeah. No shit. Took them all down. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. You got a trophy to... We got a little, a little plaque a little thing. Plaque. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's paper. That's funny. <laughs> Favorite show? Uh, like out now or like ever, ever? Ever. When oh, I was, you, let's do both. So when I was younger, it was MacGyver. Okay. Loved MacGyver. Fuck with MacGyver. <laughs> um, out now um, probably would be the Sandman. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Right, you like the fantasy, the fantasy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, United States of America, freedom, freedom, family, most important, most important. Yeah, Christmas tree. Oh, dude, that's the best time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that because you always, you know, during your family days when you speak, you always talk about. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You always talk about the <laughs> yeah. Christmas tree on the window. <laughs> so my initial reaction to that is. Christmas is my favorite time of year. Right. You know? uh, and the friend who just passed away, um, he and I would always get super hamped up during Christmas. I, I mean, we'd send each other the stupid videos. I mean, just all all, all the things, you know? Right. Um, the Christmas tree has turned from a, uh, from a, ne- <laughs> a negative experience for me where I acted out in front of my family during a time of the year when we're supposed to be together to, like, um, it's a time of the year where, like, yeah, I'm, uh, I think... I have gratitude from December 1st until December 25th. December 26th, I'm probably a little bit depressed, let's just be right. honest, because it's over. But, right. yeah, that's a month filled with gratitude for me, kind of reflecting on the year and right. how good it's been, yeah. I mean, that's all. My wife talks about Christmas all year around. Oh, buddy, it I'm was just Christmas in go. July. I just realized it's almost September. I was like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. She was saying she can't wait for it to get cold out. I'm like, we got to wait till January yeah, for it to get to that. This, this year is going to be rough. Right. Yeah. Um, will you tell the Christmas story story real quick? Christmas yeah. tree story. Yeah, I, uh, if you don't mind, I don't. I don't. Uh, when I was getting, um, before getting clean, before before getting clean, um, I got into an argument um, and did a bunch of cocaine and picked the Christmas tree up and threw it through the front window um, in front of first. his in front of his family. Yeah, front trunk first, um, and uh, unfortunately, that was not my rock bottom. Yeah. Right. Uh, when we were talking about rock bottom, you know, one of the, one of the times that I definitely was the most painful was when I was in the ICU at my mom's hospital where she was the, the charge nurse of the ICU. And I was there, uh, having trouble with my heart cause I'd done too much cocaine. That was probably one of the most painful times because my mom was there, you know, and I was just pretty obvious that I was destroying this woman, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, dude, first of all, um, you know, we're out in Elgin, Texas. Yeah. At- at the Renewal Lodge, Burning yeah. Tree, man, this place is absolutely gorgeous. Thanks. I can't thank you enough for yeah. uh, for letting us come out here today and yeah. for you sitting down and taking the time. Do you want to tell everybody about what this place is and, and what y'all do? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind a shameless plug, sure. Do it, yeah. Do it. <laughs> um, yeah, Renewal Lodge is in Elgin, Texas. Um, it's a 30 to 90 day uh, treatment center. Um, we specialize in people who've been to treatment one or two times or who struggle with a traditional 12 step program. Um, I believe, um, that what we do really well at Renewal Lodge is, um, we, we ensure that the entire family is involved in the process. Um, we want every family to come to uh, our family program. You've been a part of that. I think it's something really special. Um, 
And I think the other thing that we do really, really well is, um, which I think is lacking at a lot of treatment centers, unfortunately, is that um, we care, you know, care about the people, um, and we put those people above uh, a profit. Um, we're not here to make a million dollars. We're not here to get rich. We're just here to help people and keep the lights on. Right. Um, and I, again, unfortunately, I think that's what separates us from a lot of our competition. Right. Yeah. I've I've been I've, I've had the privilege of being here multiple family days and watching you yeah. talk to the families and you telling them that same thing and I yeah. I, I think they get it. And yeah. So I definitely support this place, man. Anything I can do to always help you or, or this place, I'm yeah, always down. That. So the way we like to wrap up the podcast, the, sure. the I Am Redemption podcast. Sure. When I say I Am Redemption, I'm not just saying me, but it can be anybody. Anybody that's been through the shit sure. found themselves at the other side. So Got it. would you like to tell the camera who Peter is? How many statements do you want? <laughs> just however many you want. <laughs> however many I want. However many I Am statements. <laughs> um, one, sure. a couple. A couple, sure. Uh, I am a father. I am... Uh, caring i am compassionate i am sober uh i am a husband uh i am a work in progress you are the man brother thank yeah. you so much brother appreciate you thank yeah. you thank you love you man yeah. love you too